As always, this episode of the Talking Wars podcast is brought to you by Green King Sport, where football is more than a game. Why not make Green King your go-to destination for this season's final stretch? With delicious food and refreshing beverages, every single one of Wolves' televised fixtures is on show at their venues. And with 900 sport venues across the UK, there's a chance there's one just walking distance from where you are. And watching football is way better with your friends and family. So why not get the squad together for some title showdowns, the race for European qualification and nail-biting relegation six-pointers. So don't forget to download the Green King Sport app to enjoy exclusive competitions and discounts whenever there's a game on. Hello and welcome back to the Talking Walls podcast. I am your host, Matt Cooper. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Dave Azapardi and Jordan Russell, but also by Johnny Phillips. Johnny, how are you keeping, mate? Good to see you. Very well. It's good to see you three as well. It's been a while. I know the um, the last time that you came on, I think it was the last time, you uh, it was on the, the eve of uh, O'Neill coming in. And I remember you saying, do you want to get this podcast out as soon as possible? Because I think this news will be old, old news. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, always, they're, they're, about, they're about to announce um, Lepetegi's departure, aren't they? Lepetegi's mm. departure. Yeah, because um, I, I, remember, I remember I spoke to you in the week and you mentioned about O'Neill and I thought, surely not. And you, you, to be fair, you were right, mate. <laughs> you, 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 you were bang on the money. Uh, but before we crack on with uh, the podcast, Dave, Jord, how have you been keeping? Listened to the pod last week, enjoyed it. All good, mate. All good, thank all you. Good. Yeah. All good. Yeah, yeah, sound. All good as well. How was Copenhagen, Jord? It was good. It was really good. Um, we, uh, yeah, I got I got sucked in a little bit really on the Tuesday night. We were out there for quarterly business reviews, and uh, I was presenting on the Wednesday slot. And Tuesday night, got in at twenty to two. Um, yeah, it was not good. They uh, yeah. they got me in with some, uh, but they said, "Oh, we we do this thing here, like we snot, we snot, we shot snaps." Was I all right, like peach snaps or whatever? No, no, just we just call it snaps. I'm not right. Okay, it was like battery acid. Yeah. <laughs> um I had four or five of them when I was away with the fairies, but um no, it was a very enjoyable time. Um yeah, I was hanging out my arse in the office on Wednesday, but we pulled through and uh we lived to fight another day. You're quite fortunate with your job though, aren't you? You get to travel quite a lot. Well, say fortunate, For- it depends if you can be bothered. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, for- fortunate, yeah. I get to see some uh I get to see some weird and wonderful places, I guess, in a way of that you wouldn't normally see. And uh yeah, it's it's got, it gives me some opportunities. I've got to go to Krakow next week, um, next month. Sorry, we work as well, so that's another place to stick off. So it's uh, nice. it's all good. Can you uh, just before we move, move on, Joel? Can I get your opinion on Dave's facial hair? And this new, this new I was gonna, this I was gonna, I was going to I was going to comment on it, but it's very like it's very it's got the Ben it's got the Ben Whites about it, hasn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, you know what? I've I've done like three or four videos with this this week, and not one person has commented. And now everyone's going to be thinking, oh, yeah, yeah flipping it. does look crap. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, it'll, be gone, it'll be gone next week, don't worry. It'll be gone, definitely. Yeah. Johnny, what have you been up to? What You were covering West Ham game, weren't you, on uh, Sunday? Yeah, I did West Ham Fulham uh, on Sunday. It was great. Do you know what? The, the reporter's position for when we do the interview shift is, is right behind the away dugout. And I was sat directly behind Traore and Jimenez thinking, oh, if only we could have those two on our bench these days. But there you go. Um, it was it was great fun. It was a good game to do. I'm, I'm, I've seriously got a lot of time for Fulham. They're really impressive the way they try and yeah. play football. And I, I love Marco Silva. You know, if, if, if ever there's, a, there's an opportunity to get him here, if we're ever looking for a manager at some stage down the line, I love Marco Silva at Wolves. But um, yeah, it was a good, good game. Really good game. Yeah. I've seen on your um, on, on your Instagram, you've been doing quite a lot of, or it feels like you've been doing like quite a lot of the games on, on the weekend. You seem to be all over the country. Yeah, it's mad. I mean, I, I, Easter weekend was mad. I think I did Wrexham, Brentford, Stoke and Portsmouth. I think I went to every sort of corner of the country and it was it was, it was great fun. It, it's a great time of year. Um, there's loads going off. And it, arguably the lower leagues is where there's a most fun going on at the moment now, especially with the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, on the horizon, it's just brilliant. So it's it's been really good fun. Portsmouth was I did Portsmouth Derby. That was a great game, and getting Portsmouth back in the championship will be brilliant as well. It's a proper club that. So no, it's it's been really good. Definitely, and uh, I believe you've got an uh, an event coming up that you'd like to tell everyone all about. I have uh, I've seen seen the posters for it. It looks great, but I'll, I'm sure I'll let you do uh, more justice than I can explain. Yeah, it's um. 
it, it, it's, it's, I suppose you could, say, you could say it's one for the oldies. Certainly, certainly not your, you lads era. And I, I well, 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 hold on. Jordan, it. Jordan will have something but, to say about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we've got, we've got as many of the remaining 1974 League Cup winning team back together for one last time uh, for a night at the Grand. It's going to be on Tuesday, the 14th of May at the Wolverhampton Grand Theatre. It's called Wolves Wembley Wonders. And it's a celebration, not really just of that amazing cup final where they beat an incredible Man City team that had the likes of Rodney Marsh, Dennis Law, uh, Summer B. Bell, all these great players in it. But also the 70s as a whole, which in truth is is the last successful era the club have had, really. A couple of trophies, a European final and lots of European qualifications. So we've got... um, We've got most of the lads who are, are still alive back together um, and it, it should be a really good celebration. Loads of footage as well of the time that the players have dug out their own personal footage and other stuff. Um, and it's in it's in support of the Wolves Foundation as well because the Wolves Foundation are brilliant. They, they, they do so much good work, particularly around loneliness and Alzheimer's and um, dementia. So we've sort of tied that all in really and uh, the foundation uh, are coming along sort of back in the night. and. Um, we'll hopefully get as many ticket sales as possible to support the foundation as well. Absolutely. If people do want to come, where can they buy the tickets from, Johnny? So they can just go onto the Wolverhampton Grand website. If you Google that, you will find it soon enough. If you Google Wolves Wembley Wonders at the Grand, you will find it and then you can get your tickets there. So, yeah, please do come along and support it if you're listening to this. Or if if you're too young for it, just bring your dad or your granddad, whatever. (laughs) <laughs> if yeah if you are listening to this um we'll be dropping a retweet or a, a post on our socials as well over the coming days so if you can't be bothered to uh google it then i'm sure you'll see it i'll put own. a link i'll put a link in the description of the pod oh, as well, make it. so make, make it so comfortable for the listeners don't you yeah <laughs> <laughs> cool um we will be touching on the forest game and the uh upcoming arsenal game probably a little bit more of a light touch than we usually would because we're having we've having johnny on we'll probably discuss more about the club and, and its future and transfers and all that stuff that everyone is probably more interested in um but dave forest game at the weekend i didn't go i don't think you did uh but it to me, it was a poor game of football between two fairly average sides in the end. Yeah, yeah. I think obviously Johnny touched on it. It looked like it was, um, you know, lots of um, almost excitement. But in terms of the quality of the actual football, it, it was pretty poor, which, uh, which, which pretty much sums it up, to be honest. I don't think we really played at the level that I've seen Wolves play before. Uh, but I suppose with having Mateus Cunha back, you know, it was a huge, huge boost for us. You could see the quality that he <laughs> added, which we've missed desperately over the last few weeks or so. Um, and yeah, you know, it, it, I, I ain't Nori missing was frustrating. I think with him in that squad, we could have uh, probably gone on to get the three points. But ultimately, I think a draw would have, was pretty much the fair result. Walls lacked that little bit of quality going forward and Forrest just sloppy all over, really. And I, I feel we we gifted them both goals as well. Yeah, I, I suppose so. I also feel like they gifted us two goals as well. And I, I, I know the Cunha <laughs> goal is, is brilliant, but take away nothing from Cunha. The defending is art. Oh, it's like if you Sunday league, you're under sevens, Dave. You'd have been you'd have been fuming at your under under elevens team that you used to manage. Yeah. Um, but George Cunha back in from the start, it it did make a, a a massive difference. I know the overall kind of performance wasn't fantastic, but just having him in there, you can see that he's almost levels above what we've we've been playing at recently. Yeah, for sure. And he's a he's a top quality footballer and um, you know, cost fifty million quid for a reason, right? I think um you can tell though as well, like, you know, I think there's been clamours and uh, almost a bit of people taking the piss a little bit out of uh Sarabia's um lack of making passes to Fraser or to me when they were up top and actually you can just see when Cunha's up there the whole team just trusts there's someone to play off a little bit more and give him give him the ball in tight areas let him play and express himself and that's what you see with that first goal like I say I think the, the defending from a Fry's point of view is shocking um, really really bad oh they've gosh. had multiple times just to t- just bring him down at any point really as long as he's not in the box and they had so many opportunities to do so but as soon as he's cut inside it's an unbelievable finish, isn't it? But you can't give anyone with that sort of quality in the Premier League that sort of time. So they'll punish you, and that's exactly what he did. Yeah, Johnny, it's good to see that even after a fairly long layoff, was it seven or eight weeks? He was pretty anonymous uh, last week, but at the Forest game, he's come back and he's like the Cunha of old, which is a massive boost for Wolves. Yeah, huge boost as well, because he, he does give us that little bit of 
ball carrying quality at the, yeah. at the top end of the pitch, which not only takes opposition players out of shape, but helps get ours in it as well. And and, and it, it's it's really good that I, I do love watching him. And he just seemed to see his, his moment. He probably he probably had done his homework on a, a particularly poor Nottingham Forest defence. They, they they really struggle at the back, and he he was absolutely gifted that goal. Uh, that opening goal, um, the way he just cut inside, it was, it was criminal defending. But it's great f- f- from from our perspective to have him back, and he he's, he he became a focal point, and and you know he's become that. And I think um, I think he seems to really relish the opportunity of just being back out on the pitch again. It, it was just yeah. a shame that we're still quite not up to full strength up, up top. But um, yeah, brilliant to have him there. Yeah, I thought even with having Wanker back in. I've seen a couple of people say he looks miles off it, but I thought he made made a fairly good impact off, off the bench. But it wasn't long after the Cunha goal that there's a, uh, an incident that, well, there's a couple of incidents within the goal that people have been given their, their, their 10 pennies worth. First off, Dave, is the the actual goal. I've seen I've seen a few people blame Saar, and, and don't get me wrong, like I've been critical of Saar this season, and I'm always the one to put the, probably put the boot in on him more than more than you guys, but I don't know how you can how you can blame Saar there. It's 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 happened in a flash. It's a it's a, a reaction. I think if anything as well, Samedo's a little bit naive not to go down because it's a it's a clear shove from Gibbs Wall because he rides it and stands up. I think the goal stands still. Yeah, I I saw that on social media straight away uh, about Saar. But when I watched the goal back, I think it's Jao Gomez uh, stood right in front of him as well, who misses sort of misses the clearance. And I'm not saying it's an easy clearance to make, but I think as as a goalkeeper, when you stood right behind and um, you know a defender or or whatever or a midfielder who's going to try and clear the ball, it's very difficult, especially when he completely misses it. Saar's going to have such a short amount of time to react to it. Um, you know, you talk about this line of vision from last week and so on, but now, you know, when you're defending, it's a similar sort of thing. But uh, the push on Samedo, I didn't notice in real time, to be honest. And, and again, it's only, I only sort of saw people moan about it's late Saturday night and Sunday, to be honest. So, um, look, you're going to have some of those go your way. You're going to have some go against you. I don't think, I think that's just been us being petty more than anything, if I'm completely honest. I think if he does go down, though, it's given us a foul. Personally, it's it's a, it's it's two hands in the back. Yeah, yeah, but the, the, yeah, there's no reaction for. I I thought the goal that West Ham had disallowed last week was soft. To be fair on the foul, but because Samedo's yeah. gone down, you've given the, that, the the referee that decision to make. Whereas you're right, I think if he stood up, you won't get it. If he does go down, I think that the referee would go to the monitor or VAR would have a look at it. But I bet they didn't even consider that for for longer than five or ten seconds. To be honest. And who else was going to get the goal? Gibbs White. I don't, George. I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't really understand why he get he got so much stick. I don't think he helped himself in the in the cup fixture um, when he did the celebration. But Wolves fans have pretty much gone for his throat ever since he left. But then absolutely hate it when he gives it them back. I think you give as good as you get, personally. He's the pantomime villain, isn't he? I think that's yeah. that's what it is. And I think, um, yeah, look, I I, um, I had no issue with the fact we moved him on um, last year and he went and, um, I'd like say, even when he'd come to Molly, he got booed a little bit, didn't he, from memory. But the yeah. cup game, yeah, the cup game, I think I think the cup game and the celebration from this penalty in the shootout is what ignited it a little bit more and that left that bit of a sour taste in, in uh, Wolves fans' mouths. But, I mean... Yeah, I mean, if 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 it was happening to you, I mean, I know if I was Morgan Gibbs White, I'd be doing exactly the same. Like, <laughs> you know, he gets pelters yeah. all 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 game. He gets a goal, six is here to you know, it's just it's just antagonised. He's playing pantomime villain. I think, um, yeah, people take it a bit too too close to heart, really, um, with it all. But it was always going to be him, wasn't it? You know, it was always going to imp- impact the game. I always thought it'd be him and Chris Wood the weekend, and at least you know, got one out of two. Maybe bingo, right? <laughs> Uh, it, and, and to be honest, mate, I thought the fans saying he was crap. I thought he had a really good game. Every, everything good about Forrest came through him. He was like, he's right. Yeah. Oh, he it, was it, one it, of the better players on the pitch, yeah. I thought, to be honest. He yeah. always he always is. Whenever I, whenever I watch Gibbs, or he's always he always tries to make things happen and he's just everywhere on the pitch. The one thing in regards, to, I get the celebration thing because as football fans, we can't expect to give 
give stick out to players and not receive it back. But the one thing I didn't like was when he shushed, unless Sarabi said something, I don't know, but he shushed he Sarabi right in the face. Yeah, yeah that, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't like that part of things, but uh, I don't know. I, I think he, he, he burnt those bridges literally as soon as he left. There were certain comments and then the cook game just, you know, sort it all out. So be interesting to see. It wasn't that bad when he was at Molyneux, but it'll be interesting to see if he gets the Nunes treatment uh, from next year onwards. As he's what, what's your thoughts on it, Johnny? Do you think it's you think it's warranted from Wolves fans or no? I think I think Wolves fans have, t- have taken it too personally, and I think they're um, I think he was b- well within his rights to have that celeb. I I I, I love fan uh, players giving it to supporters who've just been dealing out a load of stick, and if the supporters can't suck it up, then they're they want to have a look at themselves first rather than yeah. the player doing it. And um, it's tough. It's really tough. And, you know, they're, they're, they're subjected to a lot of abuse during games. So that was his moment. And he did it quite cleverly because he ran over to the Forest fans and he just the way he just turned at the Wolves fans, that's all fair play to him. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, really. It's, um, you know, it's, it, it, he's well within his rights to do that. And if, if, if he goes and does it, then the Wolves mm-hmm. fans need to be looking at themselves in the mirror if they're getting head up about that. Especially because I know they were singing it, these, these misses with a the slag as well. So, like, <laughs> <Let it go. laughs> I can't, you know what? I think if the, if they were probably, if I was playing, they were singing that about my misses, and I'd probably do the same. So, yeah, join in. What, join in? We'll yeah, probably we'll in. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, 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 I do get it. I think, I think fans are taking to heart a little bit, though. Um, yeah. I mean, fans, are, fans can be really funny and have got a great sense of humor. But they can get really childish at times when someone does something they don't like. So uh, yeah. yeah, you know, it was it was Gibbs White's moment that and just suck it up. Yeah, I've seen some of the ta- nuclear takes on on Twitter because there seems to be over the last couple of years. I think there's a few incidents that have led to it. There seems to be a bit of needle between Wolves and Forest, where it's the cup game, yeah. why the FFP breaches. It's, it's it's always lingered under the surface. I remember going there. About 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, and it was Dave Jones's first game as Wolves manager in the FA Cup, and we won 1 0 there. And I was in the away end, and it was proper toxic atmosphere that day. And the Forest fans were giving Dave Jones all sorts. And it's just, I think there's always been a little something with Forest. I remember a League Cup tie going even further back when Collie Moore and Brian Roy and all that sort of destroyed us at our place. And it was, there always seemed to be good games with a bit of niggle. I like that. Yeah. yeah. They're a yeah, proper club. Been... It's a great club for us. You know, it is yeah. a proper club with a proper fan base and a proper history. Um, so I, I love I love Wolves Forest matches. Last last yeah. season I went to Forest, we went to the cup game and the league game. And I remember yeah. saying to you, Dave, that the atmosphere last no. season was the best I've been to in years, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, I remember us doing it on the pod, and the, yeah, we said the same thing. The cup game, although we lost and come away from it, it was it's probably the best atmosphere I've been in since pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it was that good. It was, it was good. really good. Really, really yeah, good. Yeah, that, that, the Muller Kintyre, they sing Ghost yeah. Around. It's yeah, like, it's that's quite, yeah, it's class. It's proper, like, a, uh, still got quite a lot of character, hasn't it, the club? But it seems to be, yeah, it seems to be a bit in need, especially with the um, with the FFP ruling as well. I know, well, profit and sustainability, they were arguing that Wolves had sold Neves and whatnot. And I think Wolves are saying, I was on the second, something to do, he was plus he's in a different <laughs> financial year. So, yeah, you know, I don't, I, I think the, the ownership model there with Maranakis makes him a little bit, little less likable. I think he's yeah, absolutely. yeah, I think so. I, I, I think I can imagine. Well, I know he's a very challenging owner to work for. So yeah, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine him and Nuno getting on. I feel like they probably rub each other up the wrong way. Yeah, I imagine they do. I, I think George Mendes is a, a bit of a buffer there. Um, yeah. You know, he, Mendes' relationship with Forest is probably what it was once with Wolves, um, and I think. He's definitely the buffer for mm. for, for anything there, and, and Nuno probably won't have to deal with him too much unless he storms down like he did at that Liverpool match and <laughs> Wade gone down through the tunnel. But yeah, o- owner, to... owners pitching up, owners pitching up pitch side and tunnel side is always a red flag for me. That haven't they? Uh, in uh, Greece, have you gone on the pitch with a gun? Is that the same? Yeah. I I've, it definitely happened, but I don't know if it was him. I think it was him. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. I think it was him, yeah. It did happen in Greece. Uh. They're, they're yeah. All, yeah, they're all I, was, uh, I was listening to Talk Sport the week and the message you about it, Dave, and uh, Jamie O'Hara was uh, on and he spoke about under McCarthy where Steve Morgan had uh, gone down at half-time, told, said to me, sit down, 
and uh, and told the players to have more shots because <laughs> because of the wind. Does that sound like something, something Morgan would do, doesn't it? You can't you can't be doing that though, can you? Can't no, he reg- he regretted that. I remember um, when I, when I, me and Paul Berry went up to see him a year or so ago. We talked about that moment, and he regretted that. Mm. You can't you can't you can't just go in there and do that. He's he's very he's not hot headed, but he's quite a fiery character, Morgan, and you know yeah. he's very very passionate. Uh, but yeah, he, even he admitted he well overstepped the mark on that occasion. I, yeah. I can imagine. Um, it, it, was, it was a Marinakis, sorry, mate. It, it was a it was a Greek owner, but it was a Marinakis. Oh, it's not. My apologies. Uh, sorry, just a in defamation, case. defamation yeah. letter in front of us. As I previously said, Wang coming on. I thought I thought Wang looked good personally. I thought I thought he, I thought he looked really good. Looked full of full of energy. People saying he looked miles off it, but I I, I, I didn't see that personally. Yeah. I thought I thought if anyone looked off it, it was Sravia. Yeah, I think Wang added that little bit that we've been missing, and you know, just just a little bit more confidence going forward. I think obviously you've mentioned already Fraser and Chuomi or whatever, and although I don't think the service has always been there, that they, they, they just lack confidence. They look scared to to be on on the pitch, whereas with Wang straight away, you could just see that we've got. <clears throat> we've got another senior attacker on because he ran at them. He, he tries to cause, cause Forrest a few issues. Um, so I think obviously he's not going to be fully fit yet. But imagine if Wolves can get Neto back for the last two or three games, we might actually give you know have a, a couple of you know a couple more wins under our belt hopefully before the end of the season. But having Huang back, especially before what we've got three home games coming up now in a row, um, if we can get you know a good amount of minutes out of him for those three, and Cunha still getting a good amount of minutes, you know. Would look a lot better going forward, hopefully. And hopefully, Bellegarde's not too far away as well. You have some mm-hmm. rotation be- be- between them. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought I thought he did well when he come on. I thought I thought Sarabia again looked miles off it, almost disinterested. I don't know how, how you interpreted it. I know George, we, we're big we're big fans of him, but I thought the last two or three weeks he's he's, he's really pissed me off. <laughs> just bit, just looked at, it just cuts a bit of a frustrated figure and um yeah. noticed a few times in the first half he wasn't getting the ball and his arms were up and aloft and like shrugging about and I'm like I don't like that and I think they're all I think they're all couple of that though I think you see Cun you do it sometimes and Wang and it down like it do, it just doesn't it's just there's no need for it really just you got you know you're gonna lose the ball it's football he's gonna make it bad well. in the first half yeah it's um I, th- I think he's just cut a very sort of frustrated figure recently because I feel like he feels, I think he feels like he's trying to drag the team forward and he's the one doing that. And there might be some truth in that. I'd argue differently. I think Gaitner has been a revelation further up the pitch. But, mm. you know, there's, I think there's just a lot of frustration with the team. And I think a lot of that comes down to um, how the season, I don't want to say it's petered out yet, but it's petering out. I think um, we were in a real strong position before that Coventry game in the league and, you know, potentially getting a cup semi-final. And we know that lack of investment or lack of uh, squad depth, to put it politely, has probably cost us. Um, uh, it's definitely cost us a trip to Wembley, put it like that. I don't know how you feel about it, Johnny, but that Coventry game almost feels akin to the Leeds game a couple of seasons ago under large. You know, we were t- turning it up and we end up spewing it 3-2. Uh, yeah. card and it all went all went tits up from there. That's what that Coventry game feels like to me now. Yeah, it was it was a big big blow that, and also the way the way Gary O'Neill went for Mark Robbins afterwards as well was unnecessary, and it was sort of That's you could we tell thought. they were hurt. You could tell they were really really hurt by that because it was a huge opportunity um, to you know to, to to end the season on such a high, and it, and and through no fault of their own really you know a a relatively small squad with a lot of injuries they've sort of it is it looks likely that it will peter out to some degree and it was it was just a shame that it that that, that what it happened um the the, the way it did it was you know i I think it was a it was a a a real a real blow that coventry game and it's probably taken it's probably going to take quite a while to get over and and we're probably just seeing the sort of those frustrations they're a funny bunch of the the players they care immensely but that they don't all get on um, you know, I think Gary O'Neill himself has said sometimes it's a bit like being a childminder or a school teacher trying to control them. I mean, they are, they are characters. That's I mean, how I feel on this part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are characters. Teams, historically, teams that don't get on have done all right at Wolves. You know, the, the, the Dave Jones promotion winning team famously didn't get a lot of the characters didn't get on there. And I think 
And the, the, the Wolves team, its current Wolves team, has characters, vo vocal people, and they're not afraid to share their opinions. And that's sometimes, it, I, I, I was, what George was saying about those reactions on the pitch, I don't like that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, it can manifest itself in different ways. I um, I heard that O'Neill had said that he'd stop the players from doing something about all these contentious VAR decisions. I don't know what they had planned, but O'Neill had said in his post-match press conference that he'd stop the players from doing something. He wouldn't say what, but now he was saying if they wanted to do it again, I, I couldn't stop them because of my reaction after the West Ham game. Yeah, well, that, West, that West Ham game was particularly volatile situation, you know, off the pitch at the end of that one. That was quite... Um, that, that, that looked like a... a, a Sort of Mark, it, it, Gary O'Neill had um, it, it was too much even for him that decision. So yeah, things changed. I mean, mm. there's a sense of injustice, but you've got to channel channel it the right way. I think you know you can't go around with a chip on your shoulder saying, "Oh, we're getting," and thinking it's a conspiracy theory. You've got, however hard it is, you've got to just go into every game as if it's a clean slate. But I suppose when you've had the amount of knocks Wolves have had with those decisions, yeah. it's it's inevitable. That it's it's going to leave a lasting impact. Yeah, I um I I, I do get that, and I saw the interview with Jose Sar. I think he did it with Sky Sports actually, yeah. um, saying that VAR would cost us cost us ten points this season, but failed to mention that he'd got beat from a corner the week before. So <laughs> you know, it's, these yeah. the, these obviously these things are frustrating, but I feel like it's not the reason that we're in a position that we are is not just down to those decisions. I think it's no. quite a big issue, but also. Where the last few weeks just like individual um, sloppiness, especially in defence. So yeah, and, I, and and you can't be bleating about ten points. I don't know how you work that out because if you think he's, Jose Sar's not going through all the decisions our opponents have not had against us, is he? And all their dodgy, unlucky yeah. decisions. I think I think you're really clutching at straws if you start yeah. putting if you start putting a currency and a and, and a figure on how many points Wolves have lost to VAR. That's it's not the route, the route to go they, down. I mean, they, they do say it evens itself out over the season, and I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Or I think we've probably been, yeah, we probably had a harder than the yeah. most. But I just think, like you said, channel, channel that elsewhere. Just, uh, just to finish off the the Forest game, Dave. Forest had quite a lot of chances as well that they should have done better with. I think on reflection, a point is a fair result, but also it's probably not a bad result considering what Forest are, are still fighting for. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot, lots of ways you can look at it. I know, obviously, some people will be frustrated because, again, you've dropped points possibly to a team that are still battling relegation. But also, Forest, if you actually look at some of their results and how they've been playing, they haven't been awful. You know, they've really been competitive in some of their matches and and given teams diff difficult games, especially you know going away from home. So it wasn't the. Um, I, I don't think we were brilliant. Forest had a lot of opportunities, but. I think at times they did show why they're struggling a little bit because of you know I think the last five or ten minutes the quality of the passing of the ball was just awful, you know, some of the misplaced passes. So um, yeah, I, I would have gone into it. I predicted one one. I'd take a two two. And obviously for us the the big advantage and um, the big uh, positive is that we've got Cunha back and and firing as well, and hopefully uh, he'll continue that before the end of the season. Absolutely. Another tough game though on Saturday under the lights. Half, it's half seven kickoff, isn't it? On Saturday um, yeah. against Arsenal. Johnny, is is it a good time to be playing Arsenal after after the weekend? Are they are they going to crumble again, or are they a bit of a wounded animal? I don't think there's ever a good time, is there? <laughs> no, I think I think you're probably right on this second one. Uh, I think the wounded animal an analogy is probably more likely. The, um, he was he was really unhappy. Arteta in his post match interviews yesterday, and I think. I mean, the one thing they've got a European game, haven't they, this week? Is that right? Yeah, yeah they're playing players. Yeah. yeah. So that might that might work in Wolves' favour um, in terms of you know statistically teams coming on the back of an away trip like like West Ham uh, yesterday uh, against a team who's got all week to prepare for the game um, makes a big difference. Uh, so that will help Wolves just in terms of the sort of strength and conditioning and fitness levels, but. I think they'll be. I mean, it's absolutely last chance saloon. They've got to win every match now, uh, yeah. just like Liverpool. I think they've got to win every match for to overhaul City and just hope. And even then, that might not be enough. So yeah, I think it's definitely the wounded animal. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it'll be an interesting one. Dave, I'm hoping that it's it, that it's the wheels. The wheels have fallen off. There seems to be some absolute 
catastrophic. Well, a lot of Arsenal fans catastrophizing, saying it's done, it's finished. But I know City are in, you know, in pole position now, and it's you know it's second nature for them now. But it's it's still really tight at the top. So I, I, I still think that Arsenal are well, pr- probably more than likely turn us over. But yeah, it's so it's so tight. All it takes is I know City when they when I want, they want to turn it on, they'll turn it on. But you know they've. They can drop points. You know, they we've beaten them at Molyneux. I don't think we'll go to the Etihad and win, but, you know, they, they can definitely drop points and it'll make the title race interesting again. I think it, there was one bookmakers earlier already paying out on people that are bet on City to win the league. I, th- I think it's probably Paddy Fred. Power, isn't it, though? I think it's right, Fred or something. Yeah, Fred, yeah. yeah but um, <coughs> we tend to have fairly... I say this, last year we... we at the Emirates, we really struggle, but we fa- at Molyneux, we fairly have fairly competitive games against Arsenal. Um, I think just before Lopetegui joined was when we played him at Molyneux last, and we were quite unlucky there. We probably should have had talking about VAR and referees, we should have had a penalty on Guedes, and that would have changed the, the game completely. But it was, it was a fairly tight game, so I don't know. I think, um under the under the lights at Molyneux, you know anything can happen. Um, and I'm, I'm just hoping that because after commentary, I, there were people commenting saying I don't think Wolves are going to win another game again this season. I don't think we have yet, but no. you know I'm just hoping. You know we've got a run of three um, home fixtures now. Two look fairly favourable, but saying that Bournemouth have been in fantastic form. Luton are still you know still fighting for their lives, so it's going to be a difficult game. So. Who knows? It'd be typical walls to turn over Arsenal and drop points in the next two. But you know, Jordan, how do you see this one going? Do you think the half seven kickoff could have a, a positive impact? Because you know, historically, Wolves, Molyneux under the lights is a is a is a, is a great place to play football at. Yeah, I think it could. Right, I think a lot a lot will go with what happens on Wednesday night. I think they're playing Bayern. I think you see this Arsenal team; they're a very like emotional squad um, in terms of you know. For right, for better or for worse, you know they are very emotive about how they play. And I think if they go to the Alliance and get turned over, I think that'll be like a dagger in the art. Literally, I think that'll be almost be like it's what happened with Liverpool, right? They lost to Atalanta, then they lose again on the weekend. It's almost like double, double bubble. So, um, yeah, I, just, I really, you know, I I hope that the lights will be a factor, the late kickoff, one hundred percent. But I just hope we turn them over because I, I hate that club. With a passion, and I've got it's like this irrational hatred for Arsenal, like it's just the fans and the entitlement, yeah. and I just hate them. And like, I know people say, Oh, it's boring watching City win the league, but honestly, I'll take City win it 10 times in a row than watch Arteta lift the trophy, honestly. So, I hope we go, I hope we, they come to Molyneux and we turn them over because I think it'll be the you, funniest who, thing ever. Who would you rather win the title, Johnny? Who would I rather what win the title out of City, Arsenal, and Liverpool? Uh, Liverpool, really. And, I, you know, Liverpool were the team I loathed growing up as a kid, you know, living there, coming from there. I always find their fans entitled. And I, 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 Everton was the team I had a really big soft spot for back home. But since I've moved away from the city, I, have a, I, have a, you know, I feel a bit bit fonder, you know, from, from a yeah. distance. For the, uh, I, I just, I, I like Klopp. I know, he's a, I know he can be a Marmite figure, but I really, really like Klopp. So I suppose... If there was one of the three that I'd like to see win it, I probably, you know, probably to send Klopp off. Um, but you know, I wouldn't say any of them were on my Christmas card lists, to be brutally honest. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, how about you, mate? If you could pick mine, mine City by an absolute buzz ride. But probably in preference to be City, Arsenal, and Liverpool, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think mine would be as well. <laughs> I know Arsenal fans when when there's been a fair few links between Neto and Arsenal. Over the last couple of years, I know that you've reported on it day on Talking Wolves. They, they, there's so many Arsenal fans with access to like Twitter accounts. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, they're they're so sh- like everyone that I interact with in terms of doing content with have been their sound, but Arsenal like Twitter is like like ridiculous. Like I did a video like a live stream like this with an Arsenal fan before, and the guy was asking if. Um, the probability of them signing Neto. And I said, I think it was right before the end of the transfer window we played them. And I was like, no, I can't see it happening. I think you'll have another six months. Within like five minutes, it was all these people quoting what I'd said. And on on, on my whole timeline was full of it and tagging me. It's like flipping heck. Like, I've never had that before from a, from a fan oh, base. So crazy. I remember something similar. It was when I think Ornstein had reported it. Um, not this summer, the summer before. Um, and the transfer window was still open, and he picked up a knock. 
in the in the in the um when he couldn't play in the cup game on a, on a tweet before the game arsenal fans if you don't see neto not in, in he's not in the lineup it's because he's injured it's something to do with the speculation what two thousand quotes like people, <laughs> like people giving me shit about it <laughs> so i'm just i'm just staying fact i'm trying to help you out but i don't know i don't know i um i'm i'm not feeling too confident about this one but johnny would would you put hugo bueno back into the into the lineup before Against Forest, he came on and did a job, and I thought Doc has looked a little bit shaky in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I think Hugo Bueno probably needs to play as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, I, I wouldn't have a problem with putting him back into the, the starting lineup at all. Um, you know, I think he's. Um, I think he's someone who's just going to get better. Um, so yeah, yeah. He needs but, game uh, time. Though. He needs game time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if he's one of the players who, who goes in the summer, whether it be loan or on permanent. I think, I think his, his name is on that list of potential sales. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I, I think you're really getting much for him though. No, I don't think get a vast amount, but you 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 you, you get a fear thing. You get five, a fear. five ten maybe. Mm. Maybe. Was it linked with um, Celtic in January or was yeah. it above, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It? Celtic? Yeah, yeah. And, and there were some decent sized clubs after him at the start of the year as well. I think moves back to Spain and uh, Celtic could be a great move for him. I think they rejected a low move as well, like in, in the summer for him and, and in January. So mm. it'll be interested in him. Cool. Should we move on to the questions? Um, I mean, Johnny, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of well, most of the questions are just for you. Um, so <laughs> I think. I'll ask the questions and we'll probably kind of elaborate on, on, on some other things and we'll go tangent on in and out of things. But uh, Amar's music show has asked, does Johnny have any insight in what the club's plans will be? Uh, if we're unable to sell Neto in the summer, will the club be actively looking to sell one of the other big assets? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the Neto injury has really um, muddied the waters. If you, if you looked at a fully fit Neto, you could get a really big fee for him. At a peak netto, you get a huge fee for him, and then you could do a lot of summer strengthening on that one transfer fee, and you would have only lost one player, and you could bring in, say, you brought in four or five. The squad is bigger; you've got more options now. With his injury uh, record, there's a there's a question over that, and a question over the club's willingness to sp- uh, to spend money on him. And you know, if, if clubs aren't going to spend money on him, then where do Wolves get get money from? I think I I Nori. It's the one who's attracting the most interest. Um, he, he's really, really well thought of by a lot of clubs. And, you know, if, if a big money offer comes in for him, then that would be the the obvious uh, place to look for to, to generate income. I mean, others, I mean, I know Jair Gomez is another who's really impressed as well. I, I don't know what you get in terms of a fee for him yet. Um, and he's probably someone that they wouldn't, they wouldn't really want to sell. But... As always with Wolves, and I think it's, it, it should it should apply to any club really that's that's um, that wants to go about its business properly. That every player has a price. You can't you, you can't say oh he's not for sale. That, that's not, not nonsense. I think if if players and, and Kilman for example, Max Kilman, if they got a huge bid came in for him, I think they'd accept it um, straight away. So every player has a price in that level. I just think Pedro Neto just looked like the obvious player to go for decent money. Say maybe you know, a while ago, and now it's it doesn't look that obvious anymore. Um, so then you're left sort of thinking, well, wh- where where do you generate money for squad strengthening, and where do you you know what what are you what are you prepared to let go? Um, so it, it, it's it's fascinating, but I think I, I Nori would be the one who'd bring in the most money yeah. if, if we're looking away from Neto. I think with 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 Neto, it obviously the sale would be dependent on who else has been sold and for, for how much. But do you think Wolves could be in a position, Johnny, where they say, for example, clubs are only offering 45, 40 million, where Wolves are like, you know what, we'll we'll take that considering his injury record. Or do you think they'll hold on to him and hopefully he has another good season? And also the player's probably going to be putting pressure on to go to. Yeah, I think they'd take it. I mean, because They've already proved that they can play without him. It's great when he's there, but he's he's been out for long spells, and and Wolves have found a way of winning matches without him on the pitch. Obviously, it's much better to have him, but um, so I think they would take forty million, uh, absolutely, if if it was offered. It's just a shame when it was, you know, it's double that figure that was being talked about when he was at <coughs> the peak, and I just wonder if that that that's a, 
that 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 number's gone now forever, mm -hmm. and and you realistically would only get as much as forty for him. Do you do you know what Wolves were looking at before before all these injuries? I know you said double there, but do you, do you think that Wolves were actually looking for? I, I, I think I, I think I mean yeah, before all the injuries, and I'm, I'm talking a long time ago. He was rated more highly than Diogo Jota, more highly than I know. Ruben Neves is a different type of player, and he was a serious, like top top player in the making. Um, you know, it seems a long time ago. It was COVID, wasn't it, when he got that injury? I think. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 it, at that level there was an eighty million player there, unquestionably. Um, but now, you know, a lot a lot, a lot of water's gone under the bridge since then. Um, so. I imagine it's it's a bit of a conundrum for the recruitment department because there will be there will always be that tipping point. You know, when do you hold off? When do you hold off? When do you hold off? And when do you say, actually, we'll take that and move on. Yeah. Do you think that Neto himself will also be edging for a move? Yeah, I think I think he's probably he he feels a bit left out now. I think everyone else from that everyone else of the top players from that George Mendes stable has have moved on, and he hasn't. So. I, I think he, I think he'd be keen to go, um, yeah. and I, I think he's always said, I think in the, I think he said he'd give it this season, you know, sort of, and I, I think he'd expect to go in the summer definitely. Yeah, I can. I don't know if you can see another Nunes situation on on the hands if he's not sold by the start of August. Do you think he could? From from the outset, he looks like one of those players who could probably chuck his dolls out the pram a little bit. But... <laughs> Nunes was all right, you know. Nunes was. Um, I, I remember doing it. Like, I think a corporate something with him once, and he's funny and he's a good lad. But then, if if they get ideas in their heads and stuff, and and you know, from promises that imagined or real, then yeah, they can. I suppose lots of them can turn. Can't I, they? Yeah. I think it'd be. I think it'd be different with Neto as well because he's sort of pretty much been at war since he was a boy really so and i think he, you would have seen the reaction that nunez got after he did what he did i think there's certain ways to quote unquote force a move out of a club and refusing to go to, to training and stuff is the lowest of the low really so i think neto although you know he can hand in a transfer request but as long as he doesn't do what nunez do or tweet Head's gone like Stephen Fletcher did back in the day. I think it'd be all right. Yeah. I don't think yeah, it is now. The transfer request is probably not very clear that he wants to leave. Yeah, I think yeah. that would have been a conversation he probably had in, yeah. before January, to be honest. Yeah, he's got a lot of credit in the bank there, and he as well, Neto. He's given us a lot of good moments. I know he's been, yeah. I think with Neto, it's a bit different, right? Because he's had like two very long standing injuries with us, and we gave him a new contract just coming back off his uh, dislocation of his knee as well. So we've looked after him as well. So I think he'd treat the club with. A bit of respect, and I've I've got a question, Johnny, around that as well. Like, do you think it's a case of going to the highest bidder with Neto, or is he got aspirations? Do you think it's a bigger, you know, top European club is going to? And I mean that from if the highest bidder was Saudi, we saw Nevers go to Saudi. Do you think Neto yeah. could move there, or do you I think mean that, also that, a... that that was left field for me? All the indications from Neves was that he wanted Champions League football. Everything that was coming out of from his side of it was it's Champions League football and then he goes and does that that was so left field that moved so I would you know I'd, I'd imagine Neto wants Champions League football but I don't I don't I don't know you know without without knowing what he's prepared to do and where he's prepared to go I don't know <coughs> yeah mm, it's, uh, there's been quite a lot of rumours linking in with um, obviously Arsenal but City as well Johnny I'd imagine I thought he'd be, I thought he'd been the perfect City player before yeah. the um, before that injury, you know, before, when they were when they sort of spent all that money on Jack Grealish and it didn't really happen for him straight away, I thought Neto would have been a much much better fit for City. Yeah. And you know, Bernardo Silva is going to need replacing reasonably soon as well. A fit Neto, I think, is absolutely made for Manchester City. Mm. Mendes he's uh, got quite close ties as well with City, hasn't he? So yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that could be uh, could be an option. Uh, Daniel Plant has asked, can can Johnny give us any insight into transfer plans for the summer, and if we have any money to spend, even without player sale generations? Um, I mean, from what I gather, the the, the main points of strengthening that they're after are as a centre back, a centre forward, and they're prob and they are they're looking at the keeper situation. I mean, Jose Sarr is a good keeper. He makes a lot of good saves. I think the coaches, I'm not sure they think he's the right man for what they're trying to do on the ball. 
Um, and he's, he's, he's maybe not the most willing to sort of adapt. So I think, whereas Sars fine, you know, he's a top level keeper. I think probably the coaching staff are probably thinking, is there someone we can get who is better with his feet, better with distribution and can maybe learn the system a bit better? Sar hasn't really grown much this season no. and hasn't really developed the way I think Gary O'Neill and the coaches would have liked. So I imagine the keeper is something they're looking at, but it's absolutely a forward and a a forward and a centre back. I mean, the ones Shea Adams is obvious because of the fact that he'll be free and he's been linked before. Um, I'm doing the Salampton game tomorrow night, actually. So um, That's yeah, <laughs> right, um, yeah. So I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if they just went in got him to get the numbers off. Though there's another one they like the lad at Bristol City, Tommy Conway. Do you know anything yeah. about him? Yeah, he was linked before. He was in before. That's, that, that's genuine. That is that is a genuine yeah, interest. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, but again, they're, they're not sort of players that you'd run to and think, "Oh, that's our twenty goal a season answer." Um, but I think Gary O'Neill's shown really that he can he can work with players, develop them, and play a system where you don't need that out and out target man. Um, I, I mean, so you know. It'd be interesting to see what happens there. They do need a centre back as well, so I, I don't think it's any surprise to, you know, centre forward, centre back, and possible goalie as the priorities. Um, and then it, it's just it's just a case of um, what 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 level of spending is available. I think, you know, folks want walls to be self sufficient. I think they've written off 190 million. Is it in loans? They've yeah. been pretty generous and pretty good owners in that sense. Um, I think that from their perspective, they probably just don't want to keep writing off lots and lots of money. So, you know, the, the model was always player trading in, initially when Fosun were looking to buy a club back in the day. And then they entered into that partnership with, with uh, the J-League Japanese team recently. Yeah. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Balls. Yeah. And they, that, that, that's all about sort of um, development of, players, youth players, particularly academy players over in Asia and maybe bringing them to Europe. Um, so it all goes back to this player trading model of, you know, bringing in potential talent, improving its value, which, you know, it's a very worthy model. And for, for a brief time um, with Jester Fute and when Nuno was here, it, it looked like a, a really good way of working. It's difficult. It's just a difficult way of working. Um, mm. But, the, the, you know, there are, there are gems out there, but sometimes... You've got to wade through a lot of dross to get to it. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, Brighton are probably the gold standard, aren't they, from a player trading point, point of view, mm -hmm. bringing players over and developing them. But I don't, I mean, on, on this podcast, we're not we're not critical of Fosun's willingness to invest or write off debts. I think it's more the criticism around what they've done with the money and spent a yeah. lot of money on, on shit over the last few years. Yeah. yeah, the recruitment's been an issue, hasn't it? But I guess I guess it's sort of turning around a bit. If you look at yeah. the players who've excelled this season, um, there's been a lot of value and there a lot of value has been added to their initial fees. And I think, you know, Matt, Matt Hobbs would want to, to be work more and more in that direction um, and, and, and to continue that. I know that there has been large sums wasted and it's tough. It's tough to see that. I think every club wastes quite a bit of money. Um, there's, there's, there's no club that gets everything right. Maybe Brighton are, are the exception to that. But mm. um, certainly Forest have got all sorts of uh, expensive players kicking around in the in the reserves. So, yeah, it is. It's tough. It's a tough. Um, it's a tough model to work, and you need to have a, a lot of structures in place. Wolves are still at that early stage, I think, in terms of their growth. Uh, and, and and the structures they have in place, so mm. I, I think you know it, it's it's one of those that'll take time. Yeah, but Gerprit Dillon has asked any news on Fosun seeking new investors into the club as reported earlier in the year. I, I think that's just an ongoing search. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely ongoing search. I don't think there's um they've, they've changed tack in terms of that one. They they're open about seeking investment. They still are quite open about that. They've had investment in certain areas but they probably always want more it's tough we've seen with everything that's going on now there seems to be this elite level of top clubs who've got the wiggle room and then everybody else seems to be really struggling i know for, i know the owners were a bit 
I don't know if frustration is too strong a word, but they're slightly frustrated that Wolves were bracketed in this FFP danger, as in Wolves, almost as if they'd, they'd taken their eye off the ball and weren't, you know, being astute and prudent. Wolves were never in danger of, of FFP. And that, it's funny you talked about the Neves transfer at the beginning, because he, he went at the end of June last year. And if Wolves had been in any danger, Wolves could have changed their accounting period. Yeah. Um, to the end, what well, Wolves' latest set of accounts, 2022 23, goes to the 31st of May. Now, they, you're, Aston Villa have changed their accounting period to the end of June. You're allowed to do that. They've done that this year. And it, that would have taken the Neves money into that 22 23 period. But they didn't even need to do that. Um, you know, Neves is in next year's accounts. So Wolves were always, were always quite comfortable um, in, in that sense. And, and you know, we're never ever in danger uh, of, of FFP. It's, it's something on, ongoing. I mean, the Nunes sale, Matthias Nunes sale, wasn't needed as part of that. It, so they're in, they're in a reasonably, you know, you know, they're well run. But it's, I guess, the question is, how much do they want to invest going forward? I know they invested a lot initially, um, and I'm not sure it's in their model just to keep investing without a return. Hmm. No, I, I, I don't get it. I think I think fans do understand it, but especially this season where after well the, expe- the expectations were so low, and then to have the season that we've had, I feel like fans feel a little bit shortchanged the way that they're... Yeah, there's, there's always that. There's always that. You know, it goes back to that Coventry game. You never know when you're going to be in that position again. It felt like a chance missed, and mm-hmm. for all that Wolves have had a great season under Gary O'Neill, and things have been worked out really well compared. To to the mess they were in a week before the season started. Sometimes you think, you know, that moment against Coventry, we were so well placed. If we'd have just added a bit more strength, and it could have, we could have really kicked on. But and, and obviously it hasn't. So there's there's always going to be frustration in that sense. That um, what is it a chance missed? And only time will tell if that's a chance missed. If Wolves and if Wolves are never challenging for Europe again and aren't challenging for a place at Wembley again. Then it will. You, you look back on it in years to come and think that was an opportunity missed. But I think only what follows from now on will really be the sort of you know will set out whether or not this season has been a chance missed or not. What? Go on, Dave. Sorry, mate. Sorry, I was going to say. I think the one thing with in terms of the finances and transfers, what confuses people or what people tend to get confused about is the fact that, <clears throat> especially like publicly there's been a little bit more from the club, especially since January saying we don't need to sell in the summer. Uh, and that's right. If we're, like, like you just said, Johnny, we're not in a, any sort of danger of FFP or profit and sustainability or whatever. But what people do need to realise that Wolves, if they are going to be pushing this sort of self-sustainable model, yeah, Wolves don't need to sell. So we could go in with this exact same squad next year. But if we want to buy, we'll probably, we will yeah. probably have to move some players on. And that's the biggest thing. People are saying, well, you said we don't need to sell, so why aren't we buying any players? So well, you've got a grand total of zero there. So if you want to yeah. buy players, you have to sell. So I think that's the main the main issue that people need to sort of appreciate, I think. And look, I think back in the Championship in the early days of the Premier League when they were almost free spending and, you know, without COVID, we could be having a completely different conversation as well. I think that had a big impact on things. Um, but there was always going to be a time, you know, it, it, it's easily done. I think there's like Brighton are the perfect example. I know we've mentioned them a few times there, but I think in terms of ignoring January, because I think that was a frustrating window, but under Matt Hobbs, the first January under Lopetegui, I believe most, if not all of those signings were a success. And a lot of the lads he brought in in the summer have been really good players as well. So mm-hmm. hopefully from the summer onwards, if if the strategy turns out to work, it could, it could be, you know, we can judge it a bit more next year, but hopefully it'll be a much more productive summer coming up. Yeah, hopefully. And I, I, again, it's just about um, it's just about getting the balance right. I think what's what stood out this season is is the lack of balance, maybe in yeah. the squad, and that just makes, yeah, it, makes so. the, it makes the numbers look worse than they are. You think because because it it's an obvious thing about balance rather than you know we've never once been in a position where oh, there's every position feels covered. It's just had that little bit of imbalance to it that makes makes it look perhaps worse than it is. What what do you think happened in in, in January, Johnny? Because we were well, fans were told, and even going here, come out and said, you know, we won't, Sasha won't be going anywhere until we got a replacement. We're definitely getting a replacement in, and then end up with Silver and Kladisic going. I know Kladisic was 
more from the you know humility reasons letting him go mm -hmm. baby on the way and whatnot but then to end up with uh less than we started it was a bit of a kick in the teeth for fans i know now yeah it was i think in in the end the numbers that they wanted to work with just weren't there with who they were looking to bring in and they just it was just a business decision i think without without knowing the ins and outs of it there was obviously um there was obviously a position where there were one or two deals possibly in place if the numbers worked and then for whatever reason those numbers didn't work for the club so they weren't able to do that um yeah. or, or, or chose not to do it yeah do you think any it could be to do with anything around still having to pay a percentage of johnny's wages so um i know that was he's on quite big money at wolves and i believe they're still paying a percentage yeah it might have been it might it, it might have been without just without knowing the ins and outs of it yeah. you know just there's things things like that um Things like that emerge um, all the time, really, and it's you know there, there are there are numbers like that that uh, that we're not really privy to that are factored into 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 things like that. Yeah, so it, it could be it could be without. You that. know, I'm um, oh, sorry, I, I don't know if you mentioned uh, Matt. So in terms of the strikers we were looking at, Johnny, obviously the most notable one was Brogia, but I think I remember you mentioning possibly was Carlos Vinicius someone they looked at as well. Yeah, Carlos Vinicius yeah. was the one they were genuinely looking at. Brozier was never likely. I spoke to the um, people who were on the Fulham side of the deal when Fuller, he went to Fulham, and um, it was <laughs> never, ne never really a yeah. serious destination for for Brozier. The, 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 the numbers definitely weren't working with that one. Absolutely not. And I, and I think the player wanted to stay in London as well. Um, yeah. From what I gather, um, whereas Vinicius was somebody who was definitely they had a look at, and again, I. I, without being privy to the to the to the numbers and the ins and outs of why he he went somewhere else in the end, um, so yeah, but Carlos Vinicius was the one that was if 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 something might have happened, it could have been there. Mm. Wal Walter looked at him previously, hadn't they, Dave? When he was at uh, Benfica before he yeah, went to Benfica because we couldn't get a work permit apparently back then. So yeah, so, um, before he went to Spurs, wasn't it as well? Yeah, yeah. Because his his goal record at Benfica was was quality, wasn't it? And he's just, Where was he's he before? Was he at Monaco as well? Napoli as well. Nap I knew it was Napoli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Napoli and Monaco. Yeah, yeah. So he had, he had he had a really good record. To be fair, I don't think he's an awful an awful player. I think he would. I mean, in times like now when we're desperate for someone, yeah. that's why I keep looking at all the players that we're linked with. I know the Brozier, mm. the finan That's what I heard. Johnny as well. Financially, it just didn't make sense for the club. But like no, anyone it, in the commentary game or anything, an extra attack it could have been. And, and yeah, you guys as well. I know. It's just having that. It's just having that option off the bench, isn't it? But um, you know, I, I was saying before we came on. You know, yesterday sat at sat down at, at behind the bench, the Fulham bench, and Jimenez and Traore were on it, and Brozier as well. Uh, and the idea of bringing any of them on just a great. It's just a great option for a, for a, a coach to have that. And it's yeah. probably there's times this season where Gary O'Neill's just looked at his bench. And he hasn't had the option that he really wants, um, you know, yeah. and, and that's that's frustrating. But uh, hopefully in the summer, that'll be, you know, if he if, if, if he's had the, has the opportunity to do a whole summer with the players, if, the, you know, they get the sort of players in that they want, hopefully that then those circumstances won't be here next season. New contract for O'Neill's. There's talks of that being a possibility in the summer. I know it was a three-year deal to start with anyway, but do you think that Wolves are, are a, a little bit scared of him maybe going elsewhere after the season he's had? Yeah, it's a thought. I mean, don't take this the wrong way, but if we're starting next season without Gary O'Neill in charge, I wouldn't be shocked. But that doesn't mean I think he's going to move or doesn't yeah. mean that... That doesn't mean I've heard he's going to move. Not at all. It's just that I wouldn't be shocked because I think people are looking at him. Um, you know, that the, the West Ham stuff never goes away. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think he's got any reason to feel unsettled or anything like that. But I do think, you know, you know, football's football and things happen. So, um, what Wolves... And what every club has to do and what Brighton have done really, really successfully and what Wolves probably aren't in the position yet to do successfully is to move between head coaches without maximum disruption. And Brighton have even taken it one stage further. They've moved between sporting directors as well. And they've, 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 they've recycled sport or, 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 you know, they've gone evolved with their sporting director and their head coaches. And it hasn't disrupted 
them. And walls aren't quite there yet. Walls aren't in a position where, say, for, for in, a, in a nightmare scenario, Matt Hobbs and Gary O'Neill leave, then there's a massive void there. And walls perhaps haven't got the structures in place to cope with that without a lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth yet. So I think every club at the top should always be looking at worst case scenario. Where are you without your head coach and where are you without your sporting director and how quickly and how, how can that be overcome in the least disruptive manner? Um, and, you know, I, I, I think as, as Wolves grow as a Premier League club, then you'd like to think that they can be in a position where they're, where, where those disruptions are, are don't make a big difference. Um, I mean, and, and, and to give, Fosen an Im immense credit. It's Wolves are about you know going into their seventh successive season in the Premier League next year. And that's you know completely unheard of in my lifetime as following the club seven successive seasons in the top flight. So in in many respects, although Wolves have been in the Premier League for several seasons now and Fosen have been owners for nine or eight years, whatever it is, in many respects there's a lot that still has to has to evolve and there's a lot of organic development still to take place. Yeah, I think my only concern is that. It comes to talks in the summer, and and Fosun or the board tell O'Neill, look, we've not not a lot of money to spend. Um, you got to work with what you got. Get a couple of freezing, and he says, you know what, West West Ham are without a manager, the sack boys, I'm off. Yeah, yeah I mean, who knows? I, you know, I don't know what I don't know what Fosun are planning to do um, in in that sense. So yeah, who knows? Um, you know, it, it, I remember last summer there was all this talk about Fosun selling up, um, which I know sort of within the club was frustrating for them because then you know they've shown on many areas their levels of commitment and this recent purchase of or recent partnership i should say with the japanese club shows that they you, you, you know that they're that, that they want to put down roots and they want to evolve and they want to develop um but i guess as with anything there'll, there'll always come a day when the, the head coach leaves there'll always come a day when the owners change um i i, I can see why you have those fears yeah i can see why you have those fears Jordan. I was going to say for Gary O'Neill playing for West Ham as well. There's always going to be that little connection there, isn't there? Whether it's a soft connection or not, that they're, they're obviously quite a well, you know they're an ambitious club. They've got you know they spend money. They've got a big following. I think if if West Ham made a play for O'Neill, I think it'd be very difficult for him to turn that down. That's just my honest opinion. Looking at it, yeah. taking my walk off, I think it'd be tough. Quite possibly. And then would Wolves go for Rob Edwards on the same sort of lines? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> they do like Quite it. Don't they? They, do, they do like Edwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. Didn't they offer him the job um, when um... he had a meeting? He he met with them yeah. uh, um, last time around. Um, I don't know what was what wasn't offered, but he, he met with the them. Term, right? The terms weren't great, were they? Was it almost like interim charge and then see what? I don't know. Out? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. But. He definitely met with them. I think, I think we said last time it would have been interesting when Lopetegui was on his way out. If if Rob Edwards was, wasn't in the situation he was in with Luton, I think mm. he would have jumped at the chance then. Obviously, when you've just got, got promoted of a team, then I think he's proved, yeah. you know, he, I think everyone thought they'd be rock bottom and really, really struggling. The he's fact that he's done an job. Like yeah. Game week 33, 34, and he's still competitive then. Yeah. yeah, they're playing way above their levels because it, it, they've got no right to still be in with the shouts. The players, because the players aren't good enough, but the way they've developed and the way that he's and he's changed his tactics compared to the opposition, in, in the way you know, in in in, in, a, in a bit of similarities with Gary Neal in that sense, it's, it's on a sort of lesser scale um, with a less uh, a less talented squad. He's done he's done wonders, and also he showed with Forest Green when he was three at the back and um, scoring goals for fun and past teams to death. And then he's gone to Luton and shows you can do it in a more direct way, surrender possession. I mean, in, in a sense, he's you know he, he's he's a really bright coach in that sense, and a lot of clubs should be looking at them when you have to get when you have to get that edge on the pitch because you're you're not financially well resourced and can't just buy the best players. He's he's your he's your man. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we covered quite a lot there, Mike. It's a, a lot lot to talk about. I mean, I've enjoyed that, Johnny. Do you want to uh, just give a, a little plug again for your um, for your event on the on the fourteenth? Yeah, right? that'd be brilliant. So it's yeah. it's Tuesday, the fourteenth of May, and we're getting the nineteen seventy four League Cup winners back together for one last time. Uh, it's in support of the Wolves Foundation the night as well, and it's all taking place at the Wolverhampton Grand Theatre. Uh, it should be a great laugh. We've got a few surprises in store, and it it should be real fun. So go to the Wolverhampton Grand Theatre website, get tickets. Buy them for your mum and dad or your grandma and granddad, <laughs> whatever it is. 
<laughs> cool. We'll uh, we'll also leave a um, link in the description down below, and also put a tweet out or or Instagram Brilliant. post. Johnny, where can people find you if they don't already follow you? Uh, at Sky Johnny P. On on Twitter. On, on Twitter, yeah, and then Johnny Phillips Insta on Instagram. Wonderful stuff, Dave. How I'm, about I'm not on TikTok, lads. Sorry. George is actually meant to do a, a dance with us on TikTok. He'd, uh, we have a, we normally have a game at the end of the quiz, like a career path game, where I read out a player's career path and you have to get in and say who it was. And he got he got whitewashed, but he's still he's still yet to do the, the dance on TikTok. Uh, so. No, when we do when we do the end of season pod, we'll make we'll sure do he it. Does it, wouldn't it? Yeah. And also. Uh, no, we've said this before that the account's been banned. It's nothing to do with me. I'll do it. I have to do it. Look, I made a, a bet to bet, and you've got to do it, haven't you? So, <laughs> look at me. I'm going to start dancing. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, where can people find you? Should they wish to follow you, mate? Yeah, it's at Dave as a party on Twitter and Instagram. George? And TikTok, if you want, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm on TikTok. Um, so, yeah. George was seven at Instagram and Twitter. I have been enjoying your little TikToks, Dave, your little match day uh, experience vlogs. They're all right, they? Nice the West Ham one did quite well. Yeah, but different, right. different. We are talking walls across all, all platforms. If you have liked the video, let us know. If you're on Spotify or Apple Music, please leave us a five-star review. If you're on YouTube, like the video. Subscribe if you haven't. And, yeah, make sure you get your tickets for the Wolves Wembley Wonders on the 14th of May the Wolverhampton Grand Theatre with Johnny Phillips and a whole host of others. Um, tickets for that will be in the description down below. But until next time, have a great week. Take care. See you soon.